Okay, um, I'm going to talk in the breakout session about a paper that I wrote and just last week found out didn't make it into the publication. Uh, it was submitted to, um, um, uh, ah, I'm blocking, IMC. IMC, IMC, and apparently IMC has got this huge rejection ratio. I wanted to show one picture out of this paper and I'm going to talk a little bit about how it was generated and so on. What we noticed is that in the MLAB data, in this 1.4 billion rows, um, a substantial fraction of it, something like 17% of it, is from a pool of one and a half million, say, beacons. It depends on exactly how you qualify beacons. These beacons run repeated tests for whatever reason. And because they run, they're the same devices running tests over and over again, they provide results that are comparable to themselves. And so this is a simple, simple plot of 10 years, nearly 10 years worth of data in Europe showing a gradual improvement of the European internet. Um, this shows that roughly a factor of four improvement in typical performances for the beacons. Um, and uh, the way that I should describe what the graphs are, the graph on the left is a count of the number of tests per week from the pool of beacons at each of a uh, bunch of different performance levels. The graph on the right is the same data normalized such that the, the number of tests is at the, is at the top. And so it becomes percentages. Uh, so the cool thing about, one of the cool things about that graph is first of all, I, I invented a technique for using it which just seemed like something that was throwaway because it was very easy to do. It turned out to be very, very e efficient. That graph took about 40 seconds to generate from 1.4 billion rows. Um, big query is a big deal. Um, the other thing is it turns out that the um, because of the way it was generated, the data is actually linear in, a, in, a, in an algebraic sense. You can do transformations in the data that you can't do with other metrics. And I want to talk about that a bunch in my presentation and, I don't know, a bunch of other things. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. No, <laughs> you have to go to Matt's session to ask him questions. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, Reza. Uh, so Matt will be uh, at the, you're going to go to this one, the front station. Hi, thank you very much, and thank you very much to all the MLab founders and uh, everybody that's been so helpful over the years. Uh, we've really taken advantage of your uh, motivation. Um, um, uh, my talk uh, is going to be uh, about uh, standardization of internet measurements and what policy applications it has. Um, I'm sort of, a, I'll be the dismal economist. Uh, so it's going to be mostly policy applications and challenges in trying to convince um, policymakers to look beyond advertised speeds and uh, in terms of mapping. Uh, just sort of an overview here. Uh, this is a, uh, some distribution. I don't know if you can see it. It's a little small, but we can make it big. This is the distribution of speeds using MLAB data of, uh, from this uh, bandwidth with widget that RIP stat created a couple of years ago. And I just put it up here in terms of uh, understanding what kind of richness uh, of the market structure uh, this kind of data enables you to identify. Uh, here we have Canada and US. This is circa 2015, 2016. And as you see, there is these little, where is the light here? Mm, I'm not there. <laughs> there is no light? <laughs> OK, you yeah. see, this is a Canadian case. We have a bunch of bumps here around 5, 10, 15. And this is, and what we don't have this in the U.S. A few years before, you had it in the U.S. And the reason for this is that the U.S. carriers stopped st speed tiering uh, around 2011, 2012, uh, but the Canadians didn't. And this has a policy uh, underlying policy reason is that in the Canadian network neutrality, the inter um, internet uh, traffic management framework, uh, they really allowed economic traffic management practices to persist. This has changed since then. Uh, but I guess sort of my point is trying to uh, uh, extract information about the evolving market structures uh, that are very that vary across countries and in local and lo regions and localities. Um, and why is this important? Uh, um, no, before we go back, and this second uh, <coughs> uh, graphics is from a, 
uh, one of the vi nice visualization tools uh, that I don't think is active anymore was on the Google Public Data Explorer of the MLAB data, which was very useful for teaching and also for presentations to policymakers. And uh, I, the reason I have it here is because it clearly shows a variation it, in the strategies of the operators rather than just their technological endowments are important. This issue has not been explored very much in, the, in terms of the quality of service and the speeds they deliver to users, to consumers. Uh, so understanding this uh, strategic variation is very important. Here, I just want to mention, uh, you, these are the usual suspects. Some DSL providers are on the left, uh, cable codes and fiber on the right. But what is important is that some uh, cable companies that sh could be providing much faster services, they don't. Whereas there are some companies that are rural providers that actually are providing the fastest uh, uh, much faster speeds than the ones that dominate urban areas. And uh, I'll just end this. Why is this important? This picture, uh, sort of, we're trying to bring a consumer-centric perspective to this. And as you've heard, this battle around interconnection issues uh, with the network neutrality, uh, it has, it, it's important, but it has also taken focus away from why is this important for normal people. And uh, this is, uh, a graphical representation of about 20,000 consumer complaints that my uh, colleagues, Carmen, from the National Hispanic M Media Coalition, they managed to get out of the FCC last year during the network neutrality processes, and this is sort of at the center of the legal case right now. And um, I guess the point is that the speed and quality are the critical reasons why people are complaining, that they are not able to access the open internet uh, and, or whatever they want from the open internet. Uh, and this is the primary driver of the consumer concerns about Title I versus Title II. And this has just been submitted. We submitted this to the uh, NTIA call for broadband mapping. Uh, that was a couple of weeks ago. And uh, you guys, I think, yeah, you submitted something too. So basically, we use this argument of saying you should be using MLAB data as a baseline for a big data approach towards understanding the different emerging differentiation. So you can take something, some bad data like Sam knows or speed test that shows that has the essentially the last mile link. The servers are installed, test servers are installed at the cable head ends or the central offices. And that shows, and that might be realistic when you're talking about prioritized traffic or cache traffic, whereas the, and I'd like to thank the MLAB community for keeping up the standards of keeping the off-net measurements uh, uh, within this environment. And you would remain unique in that context. So we'll see if they listen to it. And finally, we'll go through some broadband mapping in, about Canada and work with various levels of government and the policy applications and implications that this has had so far. Thank you. Okay. And so Reza will be um, in that back section. Uh, and our third is Ken. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Ken Bayou. I'm with Novarum, and we're consultants to the California Public Utilities Commission. And to the theme of the previous meeting, I spent 40 years of my career building networks, including some of the early cable modems and helping invent Wi Fi. And the last 10 years has been working in these public interest areas, educating people about what Wi Fi is and trying to discover what what the ground truth is at Broadband. So we've been now uh, having a program for six years called CalSpeed, which is measuring mobile broadband in California and creating maps throughout California, and actually using that for public policy. So we were very concerned about the essential metrics of broadband in California, and we use that to create the maps you see on the right. The upper map is a map of mean download speed for AT&T. The one on the lower right is mean download speed for Sprint, roughly in the fall of last year. We are focused on mobile. We're about to kick off a process in wired and Wi-Fi as well. We're, put, we're going to put little boxes throughout California to measure, um, measure wired and, by the way, all the Wi-Fi that the box can see. Um, we're sponsored by the California Public Utility Commission. And we were originally um, funded by an NTIA grant back in 2011. And the project was successful enough that we are now using taxpayer money in California. And we're funded by the California Assembly, 
Um, Navarum, we do the design and analysis, and we have partners, academic partners at Cal State Monterey Bay who does the tools, and Cal State Chico that actually do the mapping. Um, one of the key things is that 95% of California has no crowds. It's rural. So therefore, crowd, conventional crowdsourcing simply doesn't work, because that's not the problem we're trying to look at. So instead, what we've chosen to do is we sample. So we go to two, about 2,000 California locations. We go there every six months. We take a bunch of testing tools, which are essentially smartphones these days. We run a common testing suite, and we come back again six months later in the same GPS locations. So we have essentially have here six years of data in the same place at the same time, well, roughly the same time, to the same servers. We upgrade the smartphones because we find that uh, the biggest technology is the chips inside the smartphones for the radios, as well as the infrastructure for the mobile. So we go to the carriers and say, give us your best smartphone. And we use the carrier data for that purpose. Uh, we do four, all the four carriers, soon to be three. And because we're trying to look at the complete internet experience, we measure to what we call a near server, which kind of emulates caching behavior, which is in San Jose. And we to go to a far server, which emulates the rest of the internet, which is in uh, Northern Virginia, both in the AWS cloud. Been doing it now since 2012. Open source, the code is available online. We collaborate, the data is available. The key thing is we're trying to measure what the user experience is. We're trying to say if I were, like to know what my experience is. That's why it's important for us to look at both local data and far away data, because not all data on the internet is cached. Um, because we began early, rather than NDT, our core engine is iPerf, which is also just as good. Um, one of the things it does do us is with all our throughput data is actually at the one second resolution. So as we do our tests, we have some very interesting data on how TCP changes over time. Um, we, our servers actually go to a gigabit, we, so we can get a gigabit as, soon, as long as the network between to the server can give us that. Um, one of the things we're proudest of is building our maps. You can see here these two maps. Um, <clears throat> we found a fish biologist at Cal State Monterey Bay who was sampling Monterey Bay for temperature and trying to build maps of thermoclines. And it occurred to me that thermoclines in Monterey Bay is very much like a map of broadband. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so we've, we've found a mathematical geostatistical technique called Krieging that allows us to take those 2,000 spots and essentially do a, a, a rather wonderful analysis that we think gives us resolution down to about the kilometer level with the 2,000 spots. And we have a zoom technology that we give to enable, say, a subdivision give them their own smartphones, give our tools, and they can go every 100 meters if they want to get a finer grained map that's down to the block level. And we integrate all those levels of maps together. <clears throat> and we do that for throughput, latency. We construct some synthetic measures, such as mean opinion scores for, an, for a synthetic voice over IP, which turns out to be a very important piece of information. And we try to make a difference for opinion makers. One of the key pieces that is, is now being used for is for um, opinion makers get attention when dollars are involved. So California has a fund that comes out a little bit of tax dollars called the California Advanced Services Fund. It's a mere few hundred, a few hundred million dollars. Getting access to that money to improve broadband means you have to show that there is deficiency using this test. And once you put something in, you have to show that you've developed and delivered a service again using this test. So using your, your criteria events, we have an interesting success story. Um, I'm going to make you go into detail in your session. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Can thank I do you. that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Is that okay? I want to make, one, I'll make two last okay. points. Two last points. <laughs> because we're measuring rural stuff, we have actually data about rural stuff, and it turns out that almost on every metric you can possibly imagine, rural areas have three-fifths of the quality of mobile broadband as urban areas. And because of the fact that we can um, map against other kinds of mapping data, so for example, the map on the lower right is the map of 911 calls, and we can map then where we think high quality VoIP calls would happen. And it turns out that that's only 40% of high quality voice where 911 is. The map on the top is the map of high risk fire. 
And it turns out for the two best carriers, which is Verizon and AT&T, roughly for the high, very high and severe, we all, they only cover 80% is uncovered with high quality VoIP. Good stuff. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> all right. So you have three super interesting detailed talks to go to. Uh, Ken's going to be in the conference room over there. Matt is going to. Matt wants to go to all three. <laughs> I feel bad for putting these three in the session at the same time, but thankfully you're all here to keep talking to each other. So, so that you know, Matt will be over here, Rez will be over there, and Ken will be in the conference room straight across the hall. Ready, go. <laughs>